It's pale, vaguely humanoid, and crawls out to taunt you at night. Is it the rake? Or is the rake simply the name of something that has been haunting people for centuries? Whatever it might actually be, it's apparently attacking people on the outskirts of England. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, where I complain about advertisers trying to sell me shoes that look like candy. Today I've got a new assortment of stories for you, featuring the unexplained and downright horrific. Enjoy, and remember to send me your scary true stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also check out eeriecast.com to listen to more free and creepy podcasts like this one. Now, let's begin. The Chupa Crazies from TPG So to begin my story, I have to let you know what happened too close to home for comfort. In the winter of 2000, we moved from the Midwest to a southern state, where we purchased a good 80-something acres. We're horse people and love the trail ride as well as participate in the local rodeos. That being said, we had about eight horses on the property at the time. None of them were very skittish at all. We had many other animals and do a lot of hunting on our land as well. I've never felt scared on our property, even on moonless nights with only the glow of my LG flip phone or whenever I'd sneak out of the house at night, walking the quarter mile through the fields and trees to the end of my driveway. That's where my friend would be waiting to pick me up for our adventures. One night when I was a bit older, 19 to 20-ish, my younger brother was around 15 or 16, the two of us and my live-in boyfriend at the time decided to go and watch the stars. We had the best view from the middle of our driveway that was between a horse pasture and an open, marshy, tall, grassland-like area. The grass was always tall because it was always so muddy on that side. We could never completely brush hog it all with the tractor or mow it with a lawnmower. This marshy area is to the left side of us and the horse barn to the right. The horse barn was just this open building with stalls, but at the time the horses weren't in there. They were grazing around the barn. We were lying on the warm hood of my Mercury Cougar with a blanket under us, watching the stars and catching a few shooting stars here and there too. Everything was calm and beautiful as it always felt listening to the beautiful song of our local coyote pack as they howled at the moon. All of a sudden, a new sound sent chills throughout all of us. We heard this howl that was different from the coyote's howls. It didn't even sound like a wolf. My uncle who lived with us was a huge wolf guy. I'd like to think I knew what they sounded like and I could tell the difference between a wolf and a coyote howl. This was neither, and when it howled the first time, Everything else just shut up in response. Everything went quiet, and then, not too long later, we heard it again. We then heard the coyotes scattering in the distance, or at least that's what we thought it was. Now I'm not so sure, but at the time it made sense with what we encountered. The horses were acting super nervous when just before, when the coyotes were singing, they were calm and grazing. Now they were snorting and flicking their ears in all directions, noses blowing as they tried to see what the danger was around them. We then decided it would probably be a good time to head back inside the house to grab a gun and flashlight. So we go to turn the car around and we spot something. Whatever it is, it looks like the silhouette of a very large mangy wolf. On the way to the house, we had to cross a creek bed that recently was pretty washed out and it off-centered my car on a rock, getting us stuck. This meant we had to walk in the dark without protection for about a third to a half of the length of a football field. What made this part scary was the fact that we had to climb this big steep hill and go through a bunch of overgrown trees on the way. All the while, that feeling that someone or something was watching and possibly following us. My brother ran like a bullet back to the house, out of breath and freaking out our parents when he got back. He told them what we saw and explained that we needed to investigate. I, however, refused to run because I knew that could trigger a predator's instincts. When you run, they run, wanting to chase down their prey. No, this girl was very cautious, trying to make as little noise as possible, 
I jogged from tree to tree, hoping that if something did come after me, maybe I could get up one of these trees fast enough. My boyfriend walked fast right up the middle of the hill and was in the house before I was. So yeah, the boys left the only girl alone outside. Soon I made it too. My parents gave us the keys to the truck, a spotlight, and the Beretta handgun. Then the three of us headed for that opening where the horses got nervous. From the truck using the spotlight, there in that marshy area, we spotted about two dozen sets of glowing red eyes. Each set was only about a foot or so off the ground, but these things' backs were much taller. As we tried to get a good look at them, they would stay out of the ring of light from the spotlight. No matter what we did, we couldn't get a really good look at them, but I will describe what we could see. Their heads were low to the ground, and they were super thin and skinny. Their front end was much lower than the hindquarters. They could stand up like a person too, hopping up on a round hay bale like this. They seemed very intelligent too. We pulled the truck in as far as we could, then we shut off the lights of the truck for about five minutes. Then we kicked on the high beams, hoping to surprise these animals. But they were still in the grass just on the edge where our lights would touch the ground and surrounding area instead of them. My boyfriend got out of the truck with the gun to get closer to see if he could shoot one so we could find out what they were. After all, they seemed to be dangerous to the horses. As he did this, my brother and I stayed in the truck, controlling the lights and watching around him for a sneak attack or anything like it. Come to find out, that is exactly what they were trying to do. At least a dozen of them were circled in a half circle around him before long with the truck at his back, while another group of them was off to the right of us under the branches of the tree line. They were making noises and jumping on the old rotten hay bales that we had over there at the time. It was insane because it seemed like they were trying to say, hey, look over here, let us distract you. These animals were too smart and there were too many of them. Then it happened. My boyfriend fired a shot, then another. He fired six in a row in rapid succession, which seemed to make contact because something fell to the ground and didn't move. When he tried to get closer to see if he got it, they got protective of it and began to close the circle. He then said screw this, if he did kill it he would just get it tomorrow, when it was safe and the sun was up. He told us, let's get out of here. Quickly, we drove home, telling everyone what happened and what we saw. The next morning after the sun came up around 6.30 to 7ish, we went to go and see if we could find blood or the body. But all we found was a flat circle in the grass where you could tell something had laid down there. But no blood, no trail, no hair, nothing. That was the only evidence we had and it wasn't enough. We talked to so many local hunters, game wardens, park rangers, military, everyone I knew who might have a game camera or possibly had seen it before. But no, the only answers I got were mountain lions or possibly boars. I know for a fact it wasn't either of those. Mountain lions and panthers don't hunt in packs and they do not act like that. And boars, let's be real, those were not boars. So what was this? A chupacabra? Wild dogs? Coyotes? I don't think we'll ever know. But I still live in the same house, I have my own kids now, and even today I make sure that we are all very cautious. If we are out at night, we have protection and a big fire in the yard. I want to set up game cams, but I think I'd rather not find out what's lurking around our property. By the way, this property used to be Native American land and burial grounds. I know this from the college coming out and finding pottery and arrowheads around here. My son even says he sees these things called hide behinds at night when he looks out the windows. So maybe we have skinwalkers. But whatever it is, there is always something unexplainable happening around here. But it's still my home and I would not live anywhere else. Something sinister targeted me. From Chloe K. Nowadays, the paranormal rarely scares me. It has become something I'm simply accustomed to. 
I'm comfortable knowing that there are things in this world beyond my realm of understanding. This attitude is due to one major factor in my life. I was terrorized by something sinister for four years of my adolescence. I'm from a small town in the southeast of England, bordering London on one side and rolling hills of farmlands on the other side. When I was 13 years old, we moved from our previous home within this town to another larger home on the other side of town. The property was beautiful, built on a hill with a large back garden bordering a forest. For the first few weeks of living in the house, everything seemed normal. Nothing strange happened and life was idyllic. Until one Saturday morning in September. I woke up before the rest of my family, deciding to head down to the kitchen to fix myself breakfast while I stared out at the forest. As I was waiting for the kettle to fire up, I heard this sudden low growl directly in my left ear. It was incomprehensible, just deep and guttural and loud. I yelled loudly, bolting out of the kitchen and running up to my parents. I burst through their door in hysterics, abruptly waking them up. I was near tears as I explained what happened, but my dad dismissed me kindly, saying, it was probably just the kettle. When we're sleepy, our minds can play tricks on us. I knew he was wrong, but I didn't feel like trying to argue my point. The kettle hadn't even started bubbling when I heard that growl. Besides, why would the sound reverberate only in my left ear? I tried to shake off the fear that was forming in the pit of my stomach and move on with my day. Thankfully, the 13-year-old mind is capable of doing that pretty easily. I wish I could tell you that the growl was the worst of my experiences in that house, but it was just the beginning. A few months passed and Christmas rolled around. My older cousin moved in with us. At the time, she was starting university in London. After that, the activity within the house began to escalate. My cousin began to have terrible night terrors. Terror so bad that I would hear her yelling out in her sleep from my bedroom across from her. For context, our bedrooms were opposite each other's near the top of the stairs. Next to my cousin's door was our family's altar, with both Jesus and the Hindu goddess Kali, because my mother is Catholic and my father is Hindu. This will be important later. My cousin's night terrors became so bad that she was hardly sleeping at all. When questioned by my mother and I about what she dreamt about, my cousin explained that every night she would dream of a large dark mass that would attack her in her bed. She said it felt dark and powerful, all-consuming. My mother, being quite superstitious, pinned a blessed cross on the inside of my cousin's sleep shirt. After that, my cousin's night terrors seemed to cease. I think that's when it decided to target me. It started off small the occasional nightmare of a skeletal figure crawling on my bedroom walls, hearing voices whispering unintelligible things at night, and the occasional footstep coming from our attic at night. Then it started to escalate further. One day I came back from school to a rather noisy kitchen. I found that rather odd as I was sure both my mom and cousin were at work and school, and my dad was definitely away for a work trip. Yet as I listened closer to the noise, I could distinctly make out the voices of my family members. They were talking joyfully. Shaking away my disbelief, I stepped forward and opened the door to the kitchen. Like somebody pressing pause on a TV, the noise abruptly stopped. I stared into an empty, cold kitchen. My skin immediately broke out into goosebumps, and all the hair on my arms stood on end. The kitchen felt icy and unwelcoming, like I'd interrupted something. Breaking out of my frozen state, I turned and sprinted up the stairs to my room. I only came out when I heard my mom come home from work, checking first to see that her car was in fact in the driveway. From there on out, it just kept getting worse. More small experiences kept happening on a weekly basis. Notably, a screw light bulb unscrewed itself and fell on my head while I was on the toilet. Now, in any other circumstance, that would be funny to me, however, in that moment, it was terrifying. The voices would continue on a daily basis, as well as the footsteps in the attic that would occur every day at exactly 4 a.m. Around this time, my mother and I began to constantly fight, and I began to sleep into a deep depression. 
The next big encounter didn't happen inside the house, but in the back garden. It was around 3 a.m. I was awake, unable to fall asleep. From the gap between my blinds and the wall, I could see multicolored lights. Slightly shifting about, I peered out to see firefly-like orbs floating around my garden and the neighboring woods. Honestly, they didn't scare me. I suppose I just assumed they were fireflies, even though fireflies don't glow different colors. I continued to stare out at the beautiful light, completely transfixed until they all suddenly stopped glowing, leaving me in darkness. I didn't have long to sit in my confusion, as one of the motion sensor lights in the garden suddenly went off, revealing a horrifying sight. Lighting up the path that led into the forest, the lights revealed a creature crawling up the garden path. It was small and bald, a white, thin beast which resembled an emaciated man. It was so skinny that I could see its bones protruding with every step it took. Ribs and hip bones with nearly translucent skin stretched over top. I couldn't see its face or hear it make any noise. Not that it really bothered me, as I wasn't that keen to see its face. My brain could not comprehend what I was looking at, and I tried to rationalize it. A diseased badger? A mutated deer? A crazed man? Honestly, no matter how hard I tried to rationalize it, I just could not find an answer as I stared at it in terror. The only thing I can equate it to is the rake creature from Creepypasta fame. I watched on as it walked and finally disappeared into the dark woods. I couldn't look away even if I tried, and I'm just glad that it didn't see me. As you can imagine, I didn't get much sleep that night. Later on, I found out from a few neighbors that many Satanists had taken to doing rituals in those woods behind our house. Many hikers had also found bones out there, tied in fabric and placed in strange formations all around the woods. The night terrors began to become a nightly occurrence, always the same thing. That horrible skeletal figure with red eyes, scaling and crawling my bedroom walls, never tearing its eyes off of me. It never touched me, just crawled and clicked at me. I don't think I got peaceful sleep once in all those years I lived in that house. The activity reached a crescendo when we finally moved out of the house. While packing up the house, my mother had an experience. My parents' bedroom was on the side of the house beyond the altar, and the family bathroom was on the other side of it, near my and my cousin's rooms. On a Sunday morning, while no movers were at the house, my dad had taken my cousin and I out for breakfast while my mother rested. According to my mother, after she heard us all leave, she settled back into bed. As she was reading her phone in bed, she heard footsteps coming up the stairs. Then a few moments later, the family bathroom door slammed shut. Confused and slightly afraid, my mom called my dad, asking him if he had come back to the house to use the bathroom. No, baby, I'm driving. Why? My dad replied. My mom asked him to come home quickly, detailing what she had heard. Creeping out of bed, my mom gently closed her bedroom door and locked it. She didn't come out until we came back home. The last night we were in that house, we were finishing up the last bits of packing boxes. I was upstairs helping my dad gather and pack all the wires from our computers. It was around 11 p.m. then. I'm gonna go get something to eat. You finish up and come down for some dinner. Mom cooked, my dad said. I nodded and confirmed I would be done in five minutes. I watched as my dad headed down the stairs, slightly nervous to be left alone upstairs with no altar to protect me as it had been packed and put in our new house. But as promised, I finished packing the wires and began to head down. As I passed my now old room, I froze. The door was wide open but none of the light from the landing could pierce the thick black darkness inside. I found this odd. It defied any logical thinking my brain could conjure. I began to break out into a cold sweat, a sense of deep dread settling into my bones. Then I heard it, coming from deep inside my room. Chloe. Bubbles. I wanted to faint right then and right there. It sounded like my mother, 
even using the sweet baby name she called me. Bubbles. It spoke again, but this time it sounded mocking, sounding less like my mother, and deeper and gravelly. Breaking my trance, I bit back my scream and fled down the stairs. I burst into the kitchen, startling both of my parents. They looked at me with concern, asking me what was wrong. I asked if they had called me, even though I was 99% sure they hadn't. No? Why? My mom questioned. I asked again, panicked now, if they had called my name. Nobody called you, Chloe. We've been eating. My dad answered, clearly becoming annoyed now. I dropped it, my stomach turning, as I imagined the thing in my room waiting for me to come back up those stairs. I was glad I didn't have to venture upstairs again after that. We finished packing, and we left that house behind. It's been years since I've lived in that house. I'm 22 now, and since then I've moved to Australia. My parents moved abroad too. After leaving that place, my family started sharing the experiences we all had in that house. Strangely, it made me feel better that I wasn't the only one experiencing things, even if my family didn't experience things with such strong intensity. I'll never be the same after what I faced in that house. Maybe it made me a stronger person, or perhaps it simply traumatized me. But it did definitely teach me one thing. There are things in this world that we will never understand. The Demon in My Room From Anonymous The story I'm about to tell you happened a while back. I was probably about eight years old then. It was a chilly night in the middle of November. The leaves outside were swaying with the wind, which had been making a faint howling noise just outside the house. I was finding it very difficult to fall asleep, as the atmosphere was quite loud. After a few hours, when I finally did doze off, I had a horrible dream. In it, I had been running from something. I couldn't see what it was, mostly because whatever the thing was made me too scared to look at it. But I heard the creature speak. No matter how fast you run, I'll always catch you. After it said this, I woke up in a cold sweat, breathing heavily. Once I finally calmed down, I lay there for about five minutes straight, just rethinking that nightmare. I just shrugged it off as a meaningless bad dream. I started to get up to get some water. As I tried to sit my body up, none of my limbs were moving. No matter how hard I tried, I just could not move. It was then that I noticed a dark figure in my doorway. At first, I thought it was my mother, but it was far too tall to be her. I closed my eyes tight, because that's all I could really do at the moment. I thought it was gone then, but I was wrong. I opened my eyes once more. The creature was just inches from my face now, squatting at the side of my bed that was facing the door. I couldn't really make out any facial features as my room was too dark. This thing just looked like a solid shadow. Just a moment after the thing came up to my bed, a putrid smell of rot hit my nostrils hard. It was like a dead animal had been lying right under my nose. I tried to let out a scream, but still I could not move at all except for my eyes. Then something happened that, to this day, sends chills down my spine. The creature spoke. Now you can't run. I shut my eyes as tightly as I could, and I kept them shut for what felt like hours. After a while, the rotting smell left my senses, and I felt alone again. I opened my eyes to find nothing, and I could finally move. I ran from my room quickly, sprinting down the hall and into my parents' room. I jumped into their bed to sleep the rest of the night. When I awoke the next morning, I told my mom at the table while eating breakfast about the occurrence last night. She just let it off as my imagination, but I knew it hadn't been. After breakfast, I walked into my room to find charred footprints in my carpet, 
right in front of my bed. Dogman Encounter from Horror Wolf 13. Back in 2016, I had an experience that truly scarred me for life. One night, I'd like to say it was somewhere in the middle of autumn, I'd been planning a sleepover with some friends. If I recall correctly, it was for my birthday, or for one of my friend's birthdays. We were going to have it at my house. The day before the sleepover, I spent all day making sure everything in my house was clean and neat for my friends. When I was outside sweeping the deck, I looked at the miles of forest ahead of me. Then I got an idea. I thought it'd be a fun idea for all of us to explore the woods behind my house during the day. So that day came and I was waiting by the front door for the other girls to arrive. I waited for probably five minutes before Caitlin's mom drove into our driveway. I instantly ran up and hugged Caitlin, excitedly telling her about my plan for us to go into the woods. She happily agreed and we went inside waiting for the others. Before long, the other two arrived. We were all sitting on the couch then. First off, we watched a movie and did some karaoke. Probably normal for us being 13-year-olds home alone. Then I decided it was finally time for our adventure. Joanna and I packed us some bags of necessities for the hike, while Caitlin and Sarah messed around. As we set off into the woods, I noticed that the air had grown a lot chillier since I was last out. I asked my friends, do you guys think we should just head back inside? It's getting pretty cold. But they all just wanted some fresh air, so they disagreed. I hesitantly accepted their answers and led the way. After a bit of walking, I saw something dart in my peripheral vision. My eyes glanced over to where I saw it, but before I could see anything, Sarah nudged me and pointed out a bald eagle in a tree. As soon as I gave her a reaction, I looked back over to where I saw the movement but I found nothing out of the ordinary. About an hour later, I saw the movement again. Once more, I looked over to it. This time, unlike the last, I actually saw something. Running off into a thick layer of trees was this hairy, dog-looking thing. At first, I thought it was just a coyote, but then, as it lifted itself onto two legs like a person, I knew I was mistaken. This thing looked to be about six or seven feet tall on two legs and seemed severely distorted. I screamed and pointed it out to my friends, but it was too late. That creature was gone. They were all confused, questioning me, obviously not believing what I saw. A little while later, after kind of shrugging off the event, my friends and I decided to head back to the house. It was starting to get dark then. We walked for about five minutes before we heard a stick snapping behind us. I knew my friends heard it too. It was too loud to ignore. We all looked back, not expecting much, but there stood the creature that I'd seen earlier. It was staring at us, seemingly hungry. It had these beady yellow eyes, a wide gaping mouth, and razor-sharp teeth. This time, we all screamed and ran for our lives. I ran until my legs felt as if they were going to fall off. At some point, I turned to look if the creature was still there, and to my surprise, it was gone. A little while after this happened, I scoured the internet for ideas of what this might be and if others have seen it. I found werewolves and dogmen, both of which were things people have reported sighting. Luckily, my friends and I are all still alive to this day, except now we all have a story to share with our future children and families. I know that was a sleepover that we'll never forget. The Fabian House, aka Hell House, from Born to be Wild. This story took place around the winter of 2014 or 2015, down in Thompson, Connecticut, bordering Webster, Massachusetts. I can't remember which year it was exactly, but this was the day that cemented the idea of ghosts, or things that we believe are ghosts, truly exist. I'd been on many ghost hunts with friends or on my own many times before this. I prefer to go alone because other people never take it as seriously as I do. Often, EVPs will be contaminated with the noises of other ghost hunters, 
which I believe makes up the majority of EVPs out there. People just mistake the voices or noises heard as ghostly activity. On this occasion, I was on a planned ghost hunt with my then-girlfriend, now ex-girlfriend, and a group of three or four of her friends. We all met up at her friend Mackenzie's house, which was about half a mile from the local legendary Fabian house, located on Fabian Road. The house sits next to a cornfield, surrounded by a thick canopy of trees. From the road, you can't even see a house there during the summer, because the foliage is so thick, and from satellite view, you can barely make out a house there. During the winter, when the leaves fall off, you can see the house perfectly from the street, which sits back probably 70 feet from the road. The house itself looks very strange. I'm not sure what kind of style you'd call it. Gothic, Victorian, or just Victorian. Part of the house has a tower look to it, with that pointy cone-shaped rooftop on it. To be honest, inside and out, the place looks a lot like the house on the third season of Stranger Things. It was about midnight as we walked up the road approaching the house. We were laughing and joking and talking about some of our other personal ghost stories and experiences, as well as some off-topic things. We were all quite excited, because apparently the group had wanted to explore the house, which has been a part of the local folklore their whole lives, but they never had the nerve to explore the place until I came to town sharing the same obsession with the supernatural as my new girlfriend, Nikki. As we approached the yard, we grew quiet, trying not to raise any suspicion from ongoing cars, which there were very few of, or any nearby neighbors, which there was also very few of. We kept our flashlights off as we circled around the back, looking for the path of least resistance. We tiptoed our way through the bushes and under the canopy, which was not thick this time of year. I believe it was like November. It was pretty cold out. We brought with us a power drill with a Phillips bit on it, just in case it was what we needed to get one of the big plywood boards off the window, which it turned out it was exactly what we needed. Everyone talked as I worked to get the board off the window. In the backyard of tall grass and bushes, there was about 50 old cars. It was very bizarre. They were from many different decades. Finally, I get the thing off, and immediately there was a rush of cold air from behind the board. And I mean it was absolutely freezing, far colder than the temperature outside the house. We joked and said, ah, the place must be haunted as heck. That cold air just means there's a ghost inside. It was a joke, but it was half serious. Being myself and having the most ghost hunting experience, and urban exploration experience, I climbed through first. Then I offered a hand to Nikki, pulling her inside. The rest of the group followed. Ethan, Mackenzie, and I can't remember the other two names. We were taken aback by how much stuff was inside. There were boxes of all different sizes, but also possessions of all kinds, stacked up and strewn about everywhere. Clothing, lots of books, art, dishes, electronics. Nothing that appeared older than the 70s. Some of the books looked even older than that. I'm talking 17 to 1800s, to very early 1900s. Right away, we started taking EVPs and photographs, slowly working our way through the house. I'm a bit of a treasure hunter, but also just very curious in general of everything that was inside that house. So I dug in, inspecting as much as I could while we explored. I began to notice something weird about all the belongings and just the general look of the place. It looked as if multiple generations of people had moved in, then abruptly left, leaving all their belongings behind in a hurry. You could tell by the stuff that it was from different decades, like six or seven different decades of people that had come and gone. I could tell that the rest of my party was nervous, but from my previous experience exploring deep underground war bunkers, among other places completely on my own, I wasn't easily deterred. Due to their anxiety, they joked around and talked a lot to make light of the situation, which became annoying, making it harder to do EVPs. Nikki, who was as serious as me, also became annoyed. We then separated ourselves from the rest of the group. We even hid from them in the dark as they came around one corner. We snuck around the next to avoid them. We stood there, just listening, hoping to experience something. We didn't bother taking any EVPs at the moment, because there was too much noise going on. 
The group, without us, made their way upstairs, noisily looking around. When they came back downstairs, Nikki and I snuck up through some kind of secret staircase we'd found, which we thought was super cool. By the time we got upstairs, the group was downstairs. They were calling out our names a few times, but we gave them no response. While we were upstairs, we turned our flashlights on and began exploring. We were near the window when we heard some sort of noise outside. We looked down below. The group walked single file through the cornfield with their flashlights on. Because they had their flashlights on, I was kind of annoyed that they were going to attract unwanted attention. We watched the group leave and I turned to Nikki saying, hey, just watch. Now that they're gone, things might start happening. Just then, we heard a loud noise at the end of the hallway. We even caught sight of a shadow moving in the room. We rushed out and into the room where we saw the shadow and heard the noise. When we got there, we didn't see anything except for some really old books from the 17 and 1800s. I started to pick some of them up, fully intending on taking them home as souvenirs. Before we left that room, we took some EVPs and heard some more noise downstairs so we quietly made our way down there completely unafraid and excited. We were going to be ghost hunters, the kind that took ghosts head on. We didn't run away no matter what. We continued with the EVPs, exploring the old belongings down on the first floor. That's when we found a door in the dilapidated kitchen. We opened it up, discovering it was a doorway to the cellar. I will say now, the thought of going down there made me cringe a bit. It looked so darned creepy, but I didn't let it get to me too much. Neither did brave Nikki. So we made our way down there. I was pleasantly surprised to discover that there was even more belongings and cool old stuff to dig through. Photographs, super old jarred food, all on this metal rack which at first glance we thought was preserved animals or weird things. It turned out it was just jarred and preserved vegetables. I found a couple more pristine old books that I decided to keep and a couple of really old photographs of what looked to be around 30 to 40 children all lined up in front of the house. They wore white cloaks and white cone hats on top of their heads. It was just so weird. It almost looked like the little kids were all wearing clan uniforms, except for it wasn't a full-on mask but a white cone on their head. I forgot to mention the whole time we had been keeping an eye out for a journal. We'd played with a Ouija board before heading to the Fabian house, and the board had stated to find the journal. Nikki was adamant about searching for it. Personally, I didn't take any stock in what the Ouija board had said, but I did keep an eye out. While we were down in the cellar, I saw the old ash catch for the chimney. I pried it open. It was packed solid with dirt and ash and was partially frozen. It also had some roots I could tell were growing in it. I found an old pry bar and started chipping away at the dirt, hoping to find something cool. While I did this, I suddenly got a horrifying feeling. It felt as if something really wanted us to leave, and to do it quickly. I turned to Nikki. She had a very concerned look on her face. She told me, I think we need to get out of here. I said to her, he read my mind. Right when I said that, we started to hear loud footsteps walking through the house. When it sounded like whoever was up there was directly above us, we could see dust and soot falling from the floorboards as each footstep fell on the wooden floor above. Hoping that this was one of our friends that came back to look for us, we slowly crept up the stairs, each of us with a crowbar for defense, because something primal inside of us told us that we should be afraid. And we were. It was weird, considering we had absolutely zero fear up until this point. We made it to the top of the stairs. I peered outside the door back into the kitchen, and I called in a loud voice. Hello? Anyone there? Ethan, is that you? But there was no response. I hurried Nikki to come out from behind me into the kitchen. I guided her down the hall back into the dining room from where we first entered the house. As we got next to the window, suddenly, it sounded as if a tornado erupted in the far end of the house, scattering boxes, papers, and belongings everywhere as it moved closer. Nikki and I sat there completely stunned, just staring with our flashlights back down the hallway towards the kitchen, which connected to the rest of the house on the other side of it. 
We sat and we listened as whatever it was finally entered the kitchen. We could see papers and boxes and things flying past the opening of the kitchen. I knew then whatever this thing was, I didn't want to lay eyes on it. I didn't want to see it. We had to get out of there as fast as possible. I turned to Nikki and said, Go, out the window. But she just stood there as if in a trance, not moving. I yelled again, Nikki, get out the window, now. I shoved her a little, which seemed to snap her out of it. She said to me, uh, window? Yes, Nikki, come on. She turned and swiftly jumped out the window. I threw the books that I'd taken out onto the ground and scrambled out and down as fast as I could. As soon as I hit the ground, I bent over and scooped up the books. As I came up, I knew that thing coming for us was now at the window, but I didn't turn to look at it. I didn't even have to, I could feel it, a vibration, a weight, colder than ice, heavier than the world bearing down on me, coming from that window. Nikki and I ran and ran. We ran through the bushes, out from under the canopy, into the cornfield, the same path the rest of the group had taken, then we were out onto the street. My dumb self ran with an armful of old books, unwilling to give them up. As we ran, we constantly looked behind us, trying to catch a glimpse of our pursuer. It felt as if hell itself was pursuing us, but we couldn't see it. We ran all the way back to Mackenzie's house, a half mile up the road. We were so happy to be off the street. We climbed the stairs to the second floor of the house. Then we briefly knocked before forcing our way inside. I had been wondering if one or two of our friends had played a prank on us, but as we scrambled inside, we immediately saw that every single one of our friends who had been with us now sat gathered around the dinner table playing with that stupid Ouija board. They were happy to see us. They were especially happy to see Nikki. As none of them really knew me, I was new to their group of friends, so they didn't really trust me with her yet. We told them our story. I think they believed us. I happily displayed the treasure I'd taken with me, the old books, and we sifted through them, trying to look the books up online to see if they were worth anything. We also took the time to upload all our EVPs onto a laptop. We used headphones to slowly go through them all. We got some of the most impressive EVPs I'd ever heard in my life. In one, we heard a female voice say, Why do you think they're here? And in response, it sounded like a male voice replied, Don't know. Don't let them find anything. Now, there is one thing I'd like to say about this experience. I've been to many places in the dead of night alone, and in some instances I've been deep underground in bunkers that are slowly collapsing. I'd been to these locations multiple times, but the Fabian house I never have once returned to, because I know that something dark and terrible is inside. I also believe it has the strength or power or whatever you want to call it to hurt people. I have that terrible feeling that if I went in again, I would not be able to come out. I hope you enjoyed this story, and remember that no noise is made for no reason. It wasn't a cat. From OKGuy498 okay Almost a decade ago, our home was broken into while we were on vacation. The burglars took everything. From jewelry to televisions, our house was stripped bare. My mother was distraught, of course, but thankful that it occurred while no one was home. They were just things, after all, replaceable. My father was furious, immediately calling the police. It's the kind of thing that happens to someone else, or so we thought. Unfortunately, we're all someone else to someone else, you know? As soon as possible, we had some security cameras installed. One from the top of the garage facing down the driveway to the street, one facing the back garden, and one on each side in the alleys of the house. Also, we got a fancy doorbell cam that was brand new at the time. The fact that it connected to our phones gave us peace of mind and overall comfort. Now, fast forward to 2016. My parents were planning an overnight trip to my aunt's house a few hours away. Being an angsty teen, I obviously rebelled. I love my aunt but I never liked her house. It was always so stuffy, and I ended up having to sleep in the room just full of all these creepy dolls. No thank you. 
After a full discussion with my parents and considering I just turned 15, they felt comfortable finally letting me be in charge of the house for a night and even inviting a friend over for a sleepover. I was pumped up about the freedom. The trauma of the break-in from back then was finally loosening on my mother's mind. They left 20 bucks for pizza and told me to have fun before heading out. I settled in with some video games while I waited for my friend. After a few minutes of gaming, my phone rang. I glanced down to see the friend in question was calling me. Hello, I answered. There was a quick pause before I heard a sigh. Hey bud, it's me. I'm calling to inform you that I have been grounded. I rolled my eyes. This wasn't the first time I've gotten a call like this. It's part of his mom's punishment. I wonder what he did this time. After this call, my phone and all the other electronic privileges I have will be revoked. I'm sorry I won't be allowed to see you tonight, but I've been disrespectful and I'm facing the consequences for all my actions. I'll see you as soon as I can. I sighed and tapped my foot. Sure, dude. I get it. Do better, I guess. I chuckled and said goodbye. After hanging up, I realized I no longer had any plans tonight. I guess I could just play a video game. I checked my online hubs. No other friends were on, and I didn't really like to play alone. With another sigh, I got up to head downstairs. After a few hours of boredom, I started binging some show. I was getting into it when I thought I heard something outside. I paused the TV and listened. Sure enough, I heard it again. A soft scratching sound, followed by a quiet mewing. Now, we don't own a cat, and as far as I knew, I haven't seen any strays in our neighborhood before. Curious, I stood up and started walking to the door. The mewing sounded a bit odd, leading me to believe the poor thing was hurt or something. Regardless, my intuition informed me that there was something strange about it. Right as I approached the door, I stopped, realizing what the oddity was. That meowing sound had no variation. Is that right? Like it sounded exactly the same every time. Beginning to feel a bit nervous, I suddenly remembered the doorbell camera. I pulled it up on my phone and my blood ran cold. Now until that point, I always thought that the term was a dramatic figure of speech. But no, that shiver that ran through my body was very, very real. The image on the recording showed not a cat, but a filthy looking hunched over man. His hair was long, dark, and greasy, hanging in front of his dirty face. His long, nasty fingernails were chipped and yellow, gently scratching down our door. His eyes were wide and crazed, the pupils extremely dilated and totally fixated on the doorknob. The worst thing, though, was that he was smiling the whole time. This horrifying person meowed again, and I fought the urge to vomit. I quietly backed away from the door and into the bathroom, where I called the police. The officers arrived in record time and apprehended the freak. We watched back all the security tapes, and it was uncomfortable to say the least. He had approached the door from the street. His movements had been very strange and erratic. He stopped in front of our house and, no joke, stood completely still for about 15 minutes, before suddenly dropping to all fours and crawling up to the door. Apparently, he was twacked, completely out of his mind. I have no idea what he was on or what his intentions were if I had let him in, but I doubt they would have been good. I sincerely hope he gets the help he needs. My parents once again were absolutely freaked out. I can't say I blame them after they had to come home early to this mess. I doubted I'd ever be left alone again until I was 18. But that's neither here nor there. All I can say is thank God for doorbell cameras. West Coast Rake Encounter From Sea Philly 100 My brother, his ex, our friend Lauren, my two dogs and I took a road trip from Orcas Island, Washington out to the Olympic Peninsula back in 2014. We camped out the first night in the rain. The next night, we drove down to La Push. This is coincidentally where the Twilight movies were filmed. We arrived at our destination, a place called Third Beach around 4 p.m. and saw that there were no dogs signs posted everywhere. The girls tried to convince me to leave my dogs in the car, 
but I just wasn't going to do that. My dogs are like my children. I love them, and I take them with me everywhere I go. While we were talking, my dogs just kept staring out into the dense foliage, which was kind of creeping me out. But we decided we'd take our chances with the dogs, and we started down the trail. I noticed that it was totally silent. There were no birds singing, no insects chirping. I mean, you could literally hear a pin drop. Yeah, the kind of silence that makes your ears ring. My dogs kept stopping and staring out into the forest, which had the trail boxed into either side of us. It got so bad, I had to leash them up just to keep them moving. We got down to the beach, Lauren undressed into her swimming clothes and ran into the ocean. We set up camp right up against the woods, as we could see the tide coming in all the way into where the beach met the forest, so we had a little island of sand to pitch our tent and get a little fire going. It was eerily quiet out there still, but we had a small portable speaker with us, so we played some music to lighten the mood. It got dark and we started to settle down for the night. The girls went to bed and my brother and I stayed up drinking beer. We weren't drunk or anything like that, just enjoying a couple of delicious rainier beers before turning in for the night. Because of how close we were to the woods, I had the ocean to my back and I was facing the forest. We could hear something moving around out there, but we thought it was raccoons. There are quite a few of them in that area. My dogs began growling and raising their hackles, so I figured I would try to see what it was just to be sure. I turned on my headlamp and to my horror, I could see two eyes looking back at me. The eye shine was a milky white in the dim light cast from my headlamp. They looked like two twin moons, marbles the size of a fist and about four to five inches apart. We didn't have any guns, so we started shouting and throwing rocks and sticks at the thing, thinking maybe it was a mountain lion. It turned its head away, and you could see how big it was by the profile of its eyes, making them look even more like big, perfectly round marbles. We could hear it crashing off into the brush, and we went into our tent. The girls sleepily asked us what the heck was going on out there. We told them we had chased off some raccoons, not wanting to creep them out. I couldn't sleep a wink after that. My dogs kept growling and whining, and I could hear sticks snapping in the woods, not even 10 feet from the tent. It sounded like something was walking right up to the tent, then it paused before slowly pressing what looked to be a stick into the tent flap. The dogs were growling so low and loud, it sounded like we had a diesel engine in there with us. I don't think any of us were asleep when my dog snapped at the stick or whatever, causing it to withdraw, and we could hear the thing walking back off into the woods. What was weird was it sounded like it was dragging something in the sand behind it. It finally started getting light out, and so we got up and tried to enjoy the beach for the day. My dogs were chasing seagulls, and we made some breakfast before making our way down the beach toward a coastal waterfall that we could see a couple miles south from our campsite. While we were walking, we noticed the tide was coming in very quickly. We didn't even make it to the waterfall before the tide forced us up onto a big pile of driftwood. The undertow was strong there, and there's also a phenomenon known as sneaker waves, which come out of nowhere and can pull you out into the current. The waves were breaking on the driftwood, and I was worried my dogs were going to get pulled under, so we decided to try to enter the woods and make our way back to the campsite from there. This was no easy feat, as the woods were so thick and overgrown that it made bushwhacking very difficult. We made our way into the bush, and it got extremely quiet again. We could no longer hear the sound of the waves on the beach, and just then, a small branch fell into the brush right in front of me. I looked up just in time to see what looked to be a giant pale white tadpole swinging from tree to tree above us. I say swinging because it had what looked like two arms, but its body was like an overgrown slug or something. I only caught the one brief glimpse and no one else had seen it, so I thought maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me. This place was home to the infamous banana slug after all, but this thing was way too big to be a slug and slugs don't have arms, right? We could hardly move through the dense coastal undergrowth, plus it sounded like something was swinging through the trees in circles around us. My dogs were barking and running in circles chasing the sound of whatever the thing was. 
Lauren thought we were lost, so she started crying. And between the branches breaking and the dogs barking, we were all a bit stressed out. A big branch broke right above us, that thing falling down from the tree right on top of me. I felt a searing pain in my shoulder. I reached up to pull this thing off of me. It was about the size of a dog, maybe 40 pounds, but the head was massive, its teeth still stuck in my shoulder. I could feel warm blood running down my back. My dogs both leapt up and started biting and scratching at this thing, which caused it to release its grip on my shoulder. I threw it into the bush, and my dogs ran after it. What the heck was that? My brother exclaimed. I don't know, man. Let's just get the heck out of here, I replied. The girls were really freaking out now, but we started crashing through the woods, running as fast as we could, incurring more than a few cuts and scratches in the process. I was shouting at the top of my lungs for my dogs, who still had not returned yet. Finally, I saw them up in front of us. They had the thing treed. It was about 20 feet up in a tree, hissing and spitting down at them. It looked up when it saw me and let out a horrible high-pitched shriek. It sounded like a megaphone being played through an amplifier. It made me want to puke. I could see it clearly now. It was holding onto the tree with what looked to be long claws attached to thin bony arms. The tail, if you could call it that, was wrapped around the tree. Its head looked vaguely human, but the thing was anything but. Its eyes were clearly the same as the thing we'd seen the night before. Big, milky, white, marble-like eyes that seemed to ooze spite and malice. It had translucent skin that was stretched tight across its skull. It had no nose or ears that I could see, but its mouth was huge, still red with blood from biting my shoulder. I could see rows of tiny little teeth. It had a long, pointed tongue that it was using to hiss and spit at the dogs. I picked up a rock the size of a baseball. Biting through the pain, I beamed it right at the thing, hitting it square in its face. It shrieked again and jumped out of the tree. As soon as it hit the ground, it began using its arms to crawl towards me, but the dogs were fast and pinned it to the ground, biting and tearing with all their might. It tried to fight back, but these dogs had a combined weight of at least 150 pounds. They regularly killed small animals, so they had a taste for blood and they were going berserk. I'm not sure if they killed the thing or what, but it wasn't moving. I grabbed my dogs by their collars, and we got the heck out of there. We made it back to the beach where my brother and the girls were already grabbing our things. We tore up the trail and threw the stuff in the back of my truck before peeling out of there. We'd only gone about 50 yards when that thing threw itself out onto the road in front of us. I didn't have time to react, but we could feel it go under the tires. When I looked back in the rearview mirror, I couldn't see it. I figured it had just crawled off into the brush and kept driving. I wish I could say that was the end of it. We drove straight through Tacoma where we stopped and got a motel for the night. Tacoma has a rather sketchy reputation, so we tried to bring as much of our gear inside as we could. Well, I'll be danged. That thing had been clinging to the undercarriage that entire time and was now crawling up from under the truck and onto the tailgate. Luckily, the dogs were still in the bed of the truck, so they started charging and biting the thing. It fell off and began crawling towards me again, its hideous face mangled and mean. My dogs jumped out of the bed of the truck, commencing to tear the thing to shreds. Now I knew it was dead. The dogs had bitten right through the neck, separating the head from the rest of the body. We called the cops, but no one showed up. The motel must have thought it was just some old roadkill or something, but we didn't stick around to find out. We dropped Lauren off at the SeaTac airport and drove straight back to Anacortes to catch the ferry home. I don't know if this thing was a crawler or rake or what. I always thought that was just the stuff of nightmares, an urban legend if you will. But those legends have to come from something, right? Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series. 
Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world. Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places. And Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.